technology. Focus on Liberia uncovers and showcases the best of Liberia and shows the world the truth about Liberia. We educate, elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We conduct interviews, panel discussions, debates, and more. Tune in to Focus on Liberia on Facebook and YouTube and be a part of the stories that make up the news. This is Focus on Liberia and I am Dennis Jack. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, for our folks in Liberia and other parts of the world, we say happy, happy new year. If you are in the United States, we say good evening and welcome to Focus on Liberia. This is the Liberia History Channel, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. We are so excited to be spending the last day of the year talking about Liberian history, because what a better topic to talk about the last day of the year than Liberian history. Because uh, they say, if you forget your history, you are like a tree without roots. I'm so excited to be joined by my co-presenter, Jabari, that's Darius Lam. He's known as Jabari. Jabari, welcome to Focus on Liberia. It's great to be back on as usual. And I want to welcome our chief presenter for the Liberia History Channel, Madam Carl Famula. Carl, welcome to the show. Happy New Year. It's always my pleasure to be here. And uh, I know uh, for those of you who want to welcome our viewers from across the globe, this is the Library History Channel. We're going to be discussing Library history. And uh, it's the last day of the year in Library. Now I'm getting some New Year messages. People have crossed over to 2023 already. We are still yeah. in 2022. And uh, I'm excited that uh, we are spending the last day of the year together. So am I, talking about the past, <laughs> talking about the past. Right. Jabari, uh, 20, 2000, 2022, and La history, how, how, how's everything? But this is the last day, man. Tell me, how was 2022? One word, roller coaster. <laughs> oh, and no, we are, we are so happy to be here. And today is, uh, we're going to continue with our Presidents of Liberia series. We are discussing the 12th President of Liberia, that is Joseph James Cheeseman. Joseph J. Cheeseman is the one we are discussing today. And so wherever you are watching from joining us, please uh, take a pen and a paper and be able to take notes. I always like to refresh my memory by uh, the one we recited in grade school, Joseph Jenkins, Robert, Stephen Allen, Benson, Daniel B. Warner. And then when I was in grade school, we ended with William R. Turbo. And so that was the time I was out of the elementary school. So that's the list, and we are on the 12th president today. Jabari, it's exciting. Yes, it is. Let's start with uh, you know a little roundup. We uh, we've spoken about President Joseph Jacob Roberts, Stephen Allen Benson, Daniel B. Warner, James Briggs Payne, Edward James Roy, James Corbin Smith, Joseph Jenkins Roberts again, and James S. Payne. We talk about Anthony W. Gardner, Alfred F. Russell. Last week we spoke about uh, the last episode was Hillary R. W. Johnson, and today yes. is Joseph James Cheeseman. If you are following, that's the line, so you can tell now when we're going to get to uh, President Barkley and President Tubman. Yes. So let's get this started. And uh, call again, welcome, uh, I think, uh, the Library History Channel over 2002. Uh, just give us a brief, you know, how we, where we started from and where we are today, just briefly. Yes, and thanks for catching that. That's that was the whole the whole plan. So on on um if you if you want to start the slideshow, actually that kind of goes right into it because the first couple of slides are a summary of what we have covered this year. Uh as far as the presidential series, we did have some other things that we talked about this year. Um we had a whole overall history before starting the presidents. We talked about the great kings of the Grain Coast, the King Peters of the Grain Coast, of uh, the great great the King Peters of Cape Mezzerado, I'm sorry. 
we talked about um, the establishment of repat the repatriation movement to West Africa. We talked about the Sierra Leone Company. We talked about ACS. We talked about the situation, the laws that govern the repatriation of recaptured Africans, which was initially um, what was uh, the beginning of what would later become Liberia. Um, and then, you know, we talked also about American Colonization Society, how they worked with the United States Agency for Recaptured Africans or Liberated Africans and how those two uh, missions merged to create Liberia. Uh, much of the emphasis that I've used over the year has been how this, uh, the segment of recaptured Africans have almost been erased and homogenized in with the African-American repatriates, which is, is an unfortunate thing, uh, event of history because it, it leaves out a lot of the cultural contributions of people who were uh, born in other parts of Africa and in, 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 in repatriated to Liberia in great numbers from the very first voyage of the Elizabeth, um, to the Briggs Strong and all the way through uh, uh, to the establishment of the Republic and even after Liberia became independent. So going into 2023, I'm going to do a lot more focus on those erased, uh, or not erased, but those people who have been under emphasized in our history, um, the liberated Africans and their contribution to our history and culture, as well as focusing on um, indigenous ethnicities and uh, much of what has been left out as far as their contribution to the establishment of the, of the country and that cooperation and that uh, um, united effort that has very much uh, been erased or almost uh, downplayed, um, that cooperation, that collaboration that brought the country forth. Um, the narrative has been skewed differently, um, but um, getting into recapping our presidents, um, we have had in the 19th century, the 1800s, um, we, and we've covered all of these presidents with the exception of Coleman, who we're going to cover um, in January. But Roberts, I wanted to mention their ages because a lot of people, I hear them saying, oh, these presidents are pictures, they look so young. You know, I thought all the like Grand presidents were very old men. I didn't realize they were so young. So I said, okay, let me do their ages. Um, you know, how old they were when they took over. Uh, we only had really, you know, three presidents in their 50s. We had no presidents in their 60s in the 19th century, I mean, the 18th, um, 1800s in the 19th century. So all of them were under, were either 57 or younger. Roberts, the first time he became president, what, uh, he was 38. Stephen Allen Benson, the handsome, <laughs> was 38. President Daniel Bashir Warner was 48. Uh, Roy, 54. Gardner, who was a who was a signatory to Liberia's Declaration of Independence, he became president at 57. I spell his name two different ways because on earlier documents it's spelled Gardner and then later on it's spelled Gardiner, uh, but it's the same person. Uh, president Johnson, of course, we know we just covered him. He was 46 when he took office. And then today we're focusing on Cheeseman, who was 48. Coleman was his vice president. When Cheeseman died, Coleman took over at the age of 54. Uh, also, people talk about terms a lot. The 1847 Constitution required that the election of president, and in quotes, shall be held uh, in the respective towns on the first Tuesday in May in um, every two years. So basically, every odd year, <laughs> they're supposed to be electing a president at that time, and that's based on the 1847 Constitution. That was a mouthful. Any questions there? <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. You you, you, you left out uh, Scarvin Smith. Yes, Smith uh, took over at the age, oh yes, that's true, I did leave out Smith. Smith took over, um, of course, when Roy was, was forcibly deposed um, in our first coup. They say he was impeached. I say differently. And then uh, Smith took over, and, and Smith was 42 years old. And, and I remember that just before the show, an hour before the show, I spoke with a descendant of uh, President Smith, and we just talked about him. Oh, okay. Did he watch the episode that I did? No, I send I send that episode to to her to watch it and say, Oh, hey, to her. Okay, wonderful, her. wonderful. Yeah. 
because uh, everything you want to know about the president of Liberia is right here on the Liberia History Channel. <laughs> and so we are, we are challenging, you know, we because of, Carl, I, I went through the Liberian school and I was a very good student too. So if I tell you I don't know this, you, you should know the average Liberian would not know it going through our school system, right? Right. So these things, we only recited their names to, to a greater extent, but we didn't even know that they were actual human beings. You know, we didn't know wow. who they were, where they were born, or what they did, if they had children, if they had family. You know, so we, we, we didn't really, uh, that human aspect of them was not really conveyed yes. to us as children. And, and I would like to always reflect that. So let's talk about President Chisman today. And this Absolutely. Is um, so you, do you want to skip over the slide and just jump into yeah. Chisman? Okay. They say, they say he, he's from Basra, but he looks like a gravel man. He could have very well been gravel. So <laughs> as you know, I try very hard to do the ge genealogy of the presidents because I, I find one of the things that I found is that many of these people who were um, recaptured Africans and African-Americans, again, they were, they were kind of merged together um, there was a, the lines were blurred later on, but there's a lot of code language that you hear. Um, what I want to clarify here, when we talk about liberated Africans, we are talking about people who did not serve as slaves in the United States. These are people who were captured and taken into slavery. They were released from captivity in the United States, turned over to the church, and sometimes uh, remained in the, the service of the church for 20, 15, 20 years, would be married, have children, and then you know, they had been baptized, given Christian names, were repatriated to Liberia along with African Americans. At this point, they're speaking English, they have somewhat culturally adapted. Some of the key words that are used that are uh, easy to detect, they would refer to them as Africans as opposed to Negroes. It, and they would use other words like, you know, uh, pure, um, pure blooded African is, is another common code word. Whenever I see that and I do the genealogy and I reach a dead end, meaning I can't connect them to a plantation or a date of, of, of liberation, any mention of where they serve, typically that is an assumption that I make. Now, there needs to be more research done, but with the Cheeseman clan, they did come out of Virginia, but they are referred to, all of them referred to as born free. Um, and then when you go beyond Abraham, you're not able to find Abraham's parents. And this for me was a clue. So I'm gonna leave that out there just because I don't have any definitive evidence. I just wanted to say, I was not able to trace the Chiefsons back to slavery in America. That's very important. I've, I'm able to trace um, Roberts back to slavery in America. I was able to trace Russell back to slavery in America, many others, but I was not able to trace Cheeseman back to slavery in America. Right. I explain that a little more. When you say you were not able to trace him, so you, you saw, you know, Cheeseman father, grandfather, but you were not able to connect his, whatever he was. His, his grandfather, his father, his grandfather, it, 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 it ends at his grandfather, and his grandfather was born free. Oh, okay. And and all of them are referred to as unmixed Africans. Or pure-blooded Africans. You hear all of these terms, but you cannot find, I couldn't. And I, like I said, there needs to be more research done. It's not enough to say that these people were on a ship from Virginia, because even the Elizabeth that came out of New York, we know for a fact that Smith was a recaptured African. There was a, a recaptured African named Smith. But in the records, it says he's from New York. And we know that he was born in Africa and never really was an African-American. So I'm not saying that Cheeseman was definitely a recaptured African. I'm saying his genealogy ends with his grandfather. And that's a clue. That's because there were very meticulous records kept of slaves and genealogy. And those records are available to us. So it, whenever you can't find anything beyond that, it usually means either there was a, a sudden you know, name change or something, which is unlikely or, you know, there's another explanation. Yeah, thank you, Carl. You, you're now mm -hmm. teaching us how to do some of the research. <laughs> what to look for. 
So now I'm going to, every time I do this, I, I try to um, present the presidents as they were. The reason I do the genealogy, I think ethnicity is important. It matters um, to show the full spectrum of our history. It is not appropriate what was done in the 1950s and 60s, this whitening or lightening or erasing of the true identity of our presidents. Though we were diverse, they tried to make it look like we were not very diverse. So whenever possible, and we've been able to find the photographs of all of the Liberian presidents, as you showed at the beginning of the show. Again, the, the photo on the right and the photo on the left are both President Cheeseman. Um, the, I mean, the, the sketch on the right and the photo on the left are both supposed to be President Cheeseman. Um, is the actual photograph of the uh, of the late president depicts him as he actually was, whereas the sketch from around 1952 kind of changes his appearance. Again, always skewing the appearance to look more European than African. Hmm. And this is something that we have revisited time and time again. Yes. About this uh, a sketch and the actual photograph. And we want to promise, I want to promise you, we're going to even have a separate show about this whole idea of somebody who is uh, that skin like myself. And we have a sketch that makes him appear, you know, like uh, it's mixed. Right. Jabari, is this, a, is this a common theme among African Americans and how they are portrayed here in the United States or no? No. no. Nobody wants to be white? <laughs> so, Dennis, I want to say something. This is not about the it's... presidents wanting to be white. And I want to make this known. What was done to these Liberian presidents was not done by themselves, and it was not done while they were alive. Okay. When they were alive, they were accurately depicted. This is very important. Cheeseman did not make himself look like this. This was done in the 1950s. They were dead at that time. So, and this was also done by a white American who was in Liberia uh, as, a, as a stamp uh, to, to basically help the Liberian government. It was a joint project between the US and the Liberian government to create a stamp collection. Hmm. He commissioned the sketches for the stamps. And in those stamps, they wanted these people to be represented differently than they were. You have to remember in the 1950s, there were no black people on stamps in the United States of America. There were no black people on stamps in the United States of America in 1952. There were no black heroes on stamps. So what did they, they didn't have Frederick Douglass stamp. They didn't have a uh, Booker T. Washington stamp. They didn't have a Harriet Tubman stamp. They didn't have any black people on stamps. So what they're doing now, you have this guy come in and he's like, you know what? We're gonna make these stamps a little bit more attractive, possibly. Or maybe it was a deliberate thing to erase their Africanness. How could these men be so great? This was during an era in the United States when Jim Crow was still active. You, you know, black people couldn't eat at, at certain restaurants with white people. You had to enter the back door. If you, if you were to ride public transportation, you had to sit towards the back of the bus. And if the bus became crowded, you had to stand and allow white people to sit down. You could not use, drink from the same water fountain. You could not attend the same schools. So it is not strange that a white American going to Liberia at this time would have been appalled and not wanted to represent Liberians as they were for the rest of the world. This is also a time during which there was I mean, uh, colonialism and there was a fight, a, a, a thrust against colonialism by Africans at this time. The early 1950s, you start to see Africans start striving for self-determination. You know, God forbid they look over to Liberia and see their reflection in the mirror and say, but these people have been self-governing since the 19th century. Why must we be proxy governments to colonial powers? So there was a lot of reason and motive to make these people look like they were something other than what they were. You following me? Okay. So that's really what this is about. And then you've got... Um, so you've got, let's see, where are we at? No, we're, we're talking about we're at the, uh, we're at the, the white Washington. The, the, yeah, the, the pictures. Book. So we're gonna get into the next the next slide. And I'm not, I don't know um, Frank Sherman, but I, I'm just pointing out why these images are important. 
I'm just pointing out why these photos are important. And Frank Sherman, 2010, he writes a book called The Land, Its People, Its History, and Its Culture. It was published by the Tanzania New African Press. Frank Sherman is a Liberian, I believe. And in this book, if you go to the next slide, please, he refers to, you can go ahead and read it, Dennis. It's 1893. And I wouldn't use the R there because R is not in, in my language. So it's L. So it's Glebo. Glebo tribes men attacked the American Liberian settlement of Harper during the presidency of Joseph James Chisholm. Born in Eden, Edina, Basel County, Liberia, in 1843, Chisholm N. was the 12th president of Liberia. He served from 4th January 1892 until his death on 12th November 1896. He was a mulatto, but looked mostly white. Ethnic struggles with the Kru, Gola, and Glebo tribes were resented incursions by the government and by the American Liberians into their territory occurred several times during Chisholm's reign. He initially attempted to settle tribal conflicts by peaceful negotiation, but without much success. I, so I do, you see, do you see how powerful images are? Yeah. Here someone takes their time to write a book about their history. And the image of the president, because that is the only image that he had access to or that he was most familiar with, presents this man as a mulatto. And he says in his mind, because the photo is worth a thousand words. It doesn't matter what he may have read. Because of that photograph, the narrative changed. He was a mulatto who looked mostly white, it says. And we know this is not true. I don't believe he deliberately misrepresented. I mean, I don't believe he lied here. I mean, he said this about a lot of presidents because he was looking at those photographs or those sketches, those drawings that were done for stamps. He made the same comment about President Coleman. He made the same comment about all the Liberian presidents, especially the first five. So here, you know, here's why I'm emphasizing this. We have to understand that this is important to accurately represent people. It skews history. It skews reality when you don't do that, when you don't show people as they actually were. So now this is being perpetuated. Here's this man on the left who looks like he could have been a global man from, from Plebo being you know, described as someone who looked mostly white because of this powerful image that has been repeatedly, repeatedly presented to Liberian people since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And so everyone who is alive in Liberia today that is what is in their subconscious mind. Though these men were photographed, nobody bothers to show young Liberian children their actual photographs. Right. And so I, I wanted to emphasize that I want, and I want to keep saying and saying this: these men did not do this to themselves. Right. Their images were accurately represented when they were alive. And this is why we know what they actually look like. Because when you go back to primary sources, they were black. That's how you know what they actually look like. And Carl, I, I like the way you underline that. I also want to point out that that statement alone is a paragraph standing on its own. Yes. Right? You, you can tell that... Uh, it really has no business in this place. But that's the, so it's a paragraph all by itself. There's no other details. We, we don't really want to know not much, not other things about this man or who he was, but it's just about his color and that's it. And that's why it stands alone. And, and I, I, you know, I kind of pick up- And in that. the context, in the context of this conflict between yeah. indigenous people, the entire narrative hangs on this thing that here is this person unlike ourselves. In fact, he was mostly white. He's trying to settle, settle disputes among us. Yes, and here is this man. 
And this is someone, Cheeseman, who was born at a time in Edina when he would have been surrounded by people who were closely related to Grebo people. This was a highly integrated Bassa. You had Bassa people, you had the Grebo, you had Cloud people, you had recaptured Africans all in this Edina area. Edina was actually set up for recaptured Africans. And you also had descendants of African Americans. You also had indigenous people who had been incorporated. So where Cheeseman was born and raised, he was very familiar with this diversity. So he was not a strange person. This man was born and raised. In fact, Cheeseman never left Liberia in his life. He was born there, never left the country and died there. This is important. Right. And so if you were born in Liberia, I mean, unless there was other white people there, you know, having children. So I'm saying this to say that someone born in, I'm not saying they cannot be mulatto, but it's not like he was born in the state and say, well, from the uh, slave master or something. He was born in Liberia. So this whole mulatto idea that is being promoted here, I, I, and I'm not saying that he, they cannot be born in Liberia as a mulatto, but it's, it's less likely. It would have been more relevant to this story that this that this author is telling to have said he was born in Liberia, he was born in Edina. Because that would have explained why he was trying so hard to hold the country together. But this idea of trying to make him look like he was separate. Mind you, at the same time, there were many indigenous people who were mulatto because we were interacting with European traders and women were having yeah. children with them. So, and you know, you had you had mulatto Grebo people that were indigenous to the place. Some Grebo woman would have a child with, you know, a Frenchman. It was normal and it had happened for centuries. So this overemphasis on mulattoism and this, this, I, this attempt to remove people from their country or alienate them and make them look strange, I think is, 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 is problematic on many levels. Because right. as if to say there's no mulatto indigenous people, it's, it's, it's a false narrative also at this point in history. And in fact, the very first agreement for land at Cape Maserato for Perseverance, Perseverance Island was done by a mulatto, John S. Mill. So this is, you know, he was an indigenous African and a British, you know, a, a child of an indigenous African yeah. and a British slave trader. So you have many, many examples of this. But again, it's it's about the narrative. Right. Here's a question on call, and, I, and two of these questions, I know the answer is there. I can answer one even by listening to you. He said, Prof. Call, what if that's how the writer saw his color? What if he was a mulatto but looks white? There are mulatto people who look white. So the man was photographed. The author wrote this in 2010. He was not alive in the 1800s. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so we're talking about a contemporary human being like us who's alive right now, as far as I know, right? And this book was published in 2010. And the man was photographed. No one would look at this man and say he was mulatto. He was looking at the drawing of the man. That's what. That's the whole point here. So let's yeah. let's stick with. Let's pay attention. <laughs> so he was first, looking at this man's all, drawing. First of all, to the I wouldn't around. give a lot of this relevance. There's no sources cited. It's going strictly based off of uh, the, the the photographs. The structure's all wrong. Uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not even like when I see that. I don't even see a book that should have been published. That should have been kept in the drafts. Yeah, Jabbar, you can say this, right? But these are the books that are contemporaries. These are the books that men and women who are having children, Liberian children, are using as their paradigm, the worldview about their country. Yeah. So you and I can look at it with our Western education and be condescending and say this book is not even well written. But it's important for me to not only focus on the fact that it's not well written, but that the information's false. And you and that our listeners and others who are really interested in learning about their history need to understand that this information is false. And I'm gonna lay out the premise for why. One, he was photographed. 
And we can go to the next slide, please, Dennis. President Cheeseman was not a repatriate to Liberia, but born and bred in Liberia. He remained through childhood, youth, and manhood, and in favorable and unfavorable conditions of life, true to the traditions of the Republic, honest to the love of country, and sincere to the instinct of race. Of pure African blood, he was the son of Reverend John H. Cheeseman of Edena, Grand Basel, where he was born March 7, 1843. The elder Cheeseman died June 20, 1859, leaving the youth to plow out and up his distinguished, distinguished career at 16 years of age. Of educational advantages, he had only that, if that could be so-called, which he sees from his father at home or during the intervals of hard work on the farm. So this is written in uh, the African Repository, uh, published February of 1897. And these are people who saw him, who interacted with him and described him as being of pure African blood. So again, clearly he was not mulatto and did not look almost white. And even, you know, um, the idea that, you know, you're writing, so I just, I wanna point this out because it's important. And once you debunk this, people need to understand that there's a lot more that needs to be debunked. If they can, if they can misrepresent the truth about something as basic as someone's ethnicity, what else we should be questioning is false. It's always important to go back to the sources. What I found a lot that people do is they quote secondary and third you know, hand sources and fourth hand sources, and they continue to repeat things. And there is no primary source that they're getting the information from. So if I get up right now and just say something, people start quoting it. It's wrong to do that. Um, and we know this, we've all gone to school. You know, you have to cite sources and those sources need to be credible and you need to cite multiple sources to support your information. So right now we have Cheeseman's photograph, we have, you know, a contemporary description of him. And we also have some genealogy. Let's go forward, please. Any questions before we do that? Right. I don't want to overemphasize this because I want Jabari to be able to do his presentation too. And, and is, 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 do we know his mother? Yes. And there was no white women having children with black men right. who survived at that time. Trust me. So asking me if his mother is white is just not even, it, it just, it's not, it, yeah. Those children, those products of white women giving birth to black children, those were, that was, that's what they call gator bait. <laughs> it was not a good thing. They uh, rarely survived. Some did in the Civil War. Some did, South. but that's they another story. Survived. That's another story in the South. In the Civil it is War, another thing, story, another but story. it was more often than not gator bait. Yeah, they wouldn't even, or they would just sell them off, you know, sell them off because it was not a, it was not acceptable. Let's go to the next the next slide, please. Okay, so, so we're here. Yeah. We're, now, we're here. as we always do, we do the ship manifest, showing where the family member, who the family members were. So this is his grandfather, Abraham. Abraham was thirty six. This is uh, the ship Harriet, eighteen twenty nine. This is a Harriet. This is the same ship that had our first president, Joseph Jenkins Roberts, on it. So Harriet arrives, uh, 1829. Abraham, who is the grandfather of President Cheeseman. Martha Cheeseman, who is the grandmother of President Cheeseman. They're all born free. Um, he had siblings. We had Thomas. Um, I don't know if Thomas was necessarily a sibling or just one of the uh, part of the family unit or an adopted child, that, that, but he was part of the family unit. And then you have James, who was 14, but he died in 1839 from drowning. Mm -hmm. Then you have John Cheeseman, who was nine years old, which is a brother of the president. And then you have William, who was five years old. 
And all of these people, uh, as of the 1843 census, were still alive. Um, Abraham, the ones who didn't already have a death, you know, uh, then you had a, 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 another Abraham, uh, which was four years old, which would have been, um, I'm sorry, these are not his siblings, these are his uncles right. and aunts, okay, I apologize. Yeah, that's what I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> these were the, the, these were his uncles and aunts. So John, who was nine years old, is actually his father. So if you see John Cheeseman, nine years old, that's his father. And that should be the fourth from the bottom. So mm -hmm. his 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 uh, uncle William, his uncle Abraham. Then he had a, a, another uncle named Joseph Cheeseman, who was two years old, but he died in 1829 of fever. So there was a James Cheeseman who was 14, who was another uncle who died in 1839 from drowning. He had two tragic mm -hmm. deaths, one of a James and one of a Joseph. Right. Interesting how it became Joseph James. Exactly. So his <laughs> father, who was nine years old at the time, names him Joseph James. The 1843 census, you have um, now Abraham is now 15. Um, you've got Abraham, his, his grandfather is 50. Patsy, 49. William, 17. So some of the people in the census um, had now moved on to Edina. This is a Monserrato County census. So, so as mm -hmm. you can see, some of these people have been separated. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, people had survived up until the yeah. 1843 census. We can move on. So this is this is President Cheeseman um, in his cabinet. Hmm. So the one standing above him look like Barclay. Arthur Barclay. That, that's Arthur Barclay. <laughs> Looks like Arthur Barclay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you, as we know, Barclay was in his cabinet, um, and then he's going to later become president. You got uh, G. W. Gibson, and yeah. that's all I recognize: Gibson and Barclay, and of course, Cheeseman is seated. Right. And this is the this this guy's supposed to be the mulatto guy, right? Cheeseman. Yeah, so this whole story about how like we was run by all these mulattoes and the, the black people were marginalized. And yes, there were a lot of powerful, rich mulatto people who had these massive farms and they were very wealthy and they emigrated to Liberia with wealth. A lot of them were given wealth by their, you know, the people who liberated them, probably because they were their blood relatives, like in the case of the Yuris and others. So yes, it would have been a big class divide where you would have had the mulattoes would have probably been much, not probably, they were on a, a more often than not more wealthy than the dark-skinned immigrants, just because of under the circumstances in which they emigrated. There were exceptions, of course. You know, you had self-made men like President Warner. You had, of course, the giants of all, uh, E.J. Roy. But for the most part, politically, um, the majority of leaders were were black were, were African people basically black people they were African Americans black African Americans of various hate, uh, hues and shades and the 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 this idea that everyone was separated uh, there was some huge segregation issue among the colors there's just no no actual evidence of that it's a it's a narrative that was created in the 20th century. And call this picture has been around, right? So I'm, I'm trying to uh, connect the two because this picture is actually available and yet it doesn't match the mulatto picture that we see on the as, on the sketch. But so maybe, maybe we, when, we we talk about these when we talk about these pictures being available, I like, for example, William Hurd's book. This is something I saw at Wilson Library when I was at the University of Minnesota 500 years ago. A really long time ago, when I was like 17, 18 years old, freshman at the University of Minnesota. They have a huge selection of books on Liberia. And so, yes, I knew that these people were not mulatto. Most of them, you know, William Hurd's book, the the, the bright side of African life, had photographs of him. Um, many other books as well, including even um, the Liberia volumes written by uh, uh, Harry, Harry Hamilton Johnson, that doesn't mean that everyone had access to them. Mm -hmm. In Liberia, what people had access to is what was published in their textbooks, apparently. 
Right. And these photographs have not necessarily been online all these years. You, you know that, Dennis. So a lot of these photographs are just being uploaded to the internet. So okay. before this, people had to go and actually open books right. in libraries, many of which, you know, they may not have had access to. Right. And this maybe prove how we really don't pay more attention because I've seen this photograph and I've seen this sketch, right? Mm -hmm. But I've not been able to say, wait a minute, this person, this one looks different. It's like, I just move on. And I believe there are other librarians who were like me, saw the two photos and didn't really catch it to say, okay, wait a minute. This is the uh, cheeseman, but here he looks different. He's look mulatto. Why is it so? These are some of the questions that we didn't ask over the years. And or like God. EJ Roy, right? Everyone knows that yeah. you hear every the average like real person. So EJ Roy was the first black president, but you see EJ Roy on the dollar bill looking like a Spaniard. I mean, on the five dollar bill looking like a Spaniard, and nobody has an issue with it. Right. I wonder why. Anyway. So we're gonna go ahead. I'm gonna turn things over to Jabari. Um, I just wanted to give that kind of background, like we did the last time. So Jabari's gonna go into the details, um, and. Uh, We'll go ahead and I'll, I'll follow. <laughs> Thanks, Jabari. All right. All right. So great background, great background information, because that's going to lead into to my, my presentation. So we know that he was born in Adina in Grand Bassa County in 1843. So this is before Liberia gains independent in 1847. And of course, Grand Bassa is one of the inaugural three counties. He was trained as a minister by his father, Baptist uh, missionary John Hanson, but his father dies at 16, as, as the bulletin said. So all that responsibility is going to go on to take care of his mother. Now, I didn't mention this in the, in the slides, but I'll... There he is breaking there. Now, based on what I've done, Marion Crusoe is from Monroe County, Tennessee. And we know this Jibari, word, there is a bulletin that Jibari, says Jabari okay, we lost you for like a second or so. So if you can go over that. A uh, 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 Marianne. Or yeah. So it, it, from, when he when his father died from that point. Yeah, so when his father died, he he was responsible for basically taking care of the household because at this time, you know, even though you know women in Liberia had a significant role, they were mostly relegated in how traditional Victorian era to sort of the to the household. So he was responsible for taking care of running running the household and as well as doing some education. So when his father dies at 16, that's going to be a major turning point in his life. And that's also going to lead later on, like I said, in 1865 to the marriage to the marriage of Mary Ann Crusoe. Now, oftentimes when we talk about the Liberian presidents, we don't talk about the first ladies. We don't talk about Jane Wayne Roberts. We don't talk about Nancy Benson. We don't talk about sort of the first ladies. So he's going to marry a woman by the name of Mary Ann Crusoe. She's very well educated. Like I stated earlier, she comes from Monroe County, Tennessee. And we know this because if you look at the primary sources of the African Repository and Colonial Journal, it's going to say the Liberia packet. And her name is Mary Ann under the name John Crusoe. And we know that it's his wife because at the age, this is in 1850, 1852, it says nine years old. So he's going to marry Mary Ann Crusoe. And she, we have a photograph of her. She's one of the few first ladies in Liberia that we have an actual photograph of uh, in the 1890s when she is rising along with Joseph James Cheeson. So that is something to be aware of is Marianne Crusoe and the role that she plays because she's going to play a pivotal role during his presidency in the 1890s. In November 1868, he was ordained as a pastor of the First Baptist Church in Edina. He also worked as a merchant and gained prominence among the coastal merchants in spite, in spite of what he went through. And of course, he was educated in Liberia and he attended Liberia College. Liberia College is now the University of Liberia. Yeah, yes, University of Liberia. <laughs> Correct. Thank you. Now, he has an incredible career. And this is a thing about the, a lot of the Liberian presidents. These Liberian presidents were not people that didn't know no better. 
the, the way that they portray him is like, oh, they didn't really know no better. They copied their slave master's mentality. You will hear that a lot when you're talking about the Liberian presidents. These Liberian presidents were not ignorant. They were not stupid. They, they, were, they were able to think for themselves. Many of them were some of the first major Black achievements in, 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 of the African-American community. James Gibbing Smith is one of them, being in medical college. We have uh, someone else unknown, uh, Martin Henry Freeman, first African-American of a president of a college. He's going to go to Liberia. So these people were not people that didn't know no better. They were highly educated men when they assumed the office. So in 1868 to 1882, he's ordained as a minister. 1871, he's in superintendent of the Southern Baptist Mission. 1868 to 1892, president of the Liberian Baptist Convention. 1872 to 1875, collector of customs, Port of Grand Bassa County. And then from 1875 to 1879, he's a representative of Grand Bassa County, and he's also going to serve as mayor of Edina. Mm. So... In 1871, he was superintendent of Southern Baptist Mission. Talk a little about that because, and I like the point you made that uh, anytime I read, go through these Liberian presidents, the, those presidents those days, they went through the ranks. I mean, they were not, as we say in Liberia, fly by night people. So, what does it mean to be president of the Southern Baptist Mission? So, when you are president of the Southern Baptist Mission, you are responsible for the operations of how the church is going. Missionary schools, uh, evangelization, that's all that you're going to be responsible for when you are president of the Liberian of the Liberian Baptist Convention and superintendent of the Southern Baptist Mission. So he's responsible for overseeing the Baptist churches in Liberia from the 1868 to 1892. And, and that's huge because a lot of these missionaries or a lot of the churches in Liberia were stopped by foreign missionaries. Foreign missionaries were some of the major uh, influences within Liberian society early on. And one of the things that they often talked about was having Black African missionaries, Black people who were running these churches. And so when he is leading the Liberian Baptist Convention and he's being superintendent of the Southern Baptist Mission, He's now influencing the people around him, especially the indigenous population that is there as well. So to describe his role, that, that's what he's responsible for. Yeah. No, that, that's, that, that's important. And then from the church to a collector of customs to a representative and as somewhere I saw mayor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mayor, talking about executive experience. So church. Uh, executive experience and collector. Impressive. And that's not all, right? No, nope, that's not that's not all either. Um, in 1884 to 1891, he's judge court of quarterly sessions and common pleas. And then in 1892 to 1896, he becomes president. But one thing that's not mentioned is he ran for presidency earlier in the 1880s, but he loses to President Anthony W. Gardner. So he has already been in the political realm for quite some time before he gets that presidency in 1892 when he selects William D. Coleman as his vice president. So again, church, business, government, and he collected in Grand Bassa and he became a judge before his election. So again, he's well endowed. And the Liberian Bulletin describes him. He says his motto is, whatever so thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. And one speculation is James Cheeseman, Joseph Cheeseman dies because he's overworked and he's stressed because of all the work that he has to do and the responsibility that he's had in, in 1896. He's going to be one of the, the, the first Liberian presidents, or we can argue the first Liberian president, to die in office. Right. And and that verse is in uh, Ecclesiastes 9.10. It says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. So, and, and I think that buttress the speculation you said that this man said, hey, whatsoever your hand find to do, do it because when you die, you're not going to work, right? 
So it's possible what you there's a possibility that this uh, he worked himself to death. And before he became and before he became a member of the true way, he was part of the Republican Party. So again, the Republican Party is still going to be around, but they don't win elections as they did with James Briggs Payne. After James Briggs Payne, that's when the Republican Party basically ceases to become a, a national force in Liberia. You did have one last gasp with Edward Wilmot Blyden when he runs in 1884, but he gets defeated by Hillary R. W. Johnson. And by that point, the Republican Party is, is practically non-existent. So his presidency. So when he comes in 1892, there is a lot going on. But this is some of the domestic stuff that's going on. He focuses on implementing fiscal policies to increase the nation's revenue. Uh, legislative act allowed administration to buy a gunboat from Europe. And that's one of the things in primary sources they talk about is he tried to build up the military. It was then that he used it to patrol the shores and prevent steamers from entering unauthorized ports. I just want to add that he actually acquired two gunboats. Mm -hmm. Two gunboats. Yes. With our with Liberian resources. <laughs> two gunboats. So to protect and defend a, to defend the, the country, it, it's 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 uh, it's shores, uh, which was incredible. It's gonna um, come. It's gonna come up handy later. It's gonna come on uh, handy in his presidency later on in his presidency. Exactly. Right. What was the threat for which he was getting this gunboat? We're we're gonna learn. It's, it's in the it's, it's in the upcoming. He's not even get into it. I just wanted to make sure that we understood it was two that that yes. which is a, you know one is great but two is just incredible for me. I was I was with everything that was stacked up against them to be able to even accomplish this. Um, yeah, powerful. So we're continuing on the domestic side. He curbed the smuggling of goods into the country and increased national revenue. He an act was passed requiring custom duties to be paid in gold only. Uh, another fiscal measure of the administration was creating a sound legal tenor of the country and change the nation's currency from paper note to gold. So he's trying to, to grow the economy. He's trying to give more autonomy to to Liberia's economy because before we talked about this earlier, oftentimes a lot of these Liberian presidents had to take out loans or it, it was financially. It was it was very difficult. So he's trying to see if, if Liberia can become independent, self-sustaining. Continue on. Okay. He's curbed smuggling of goods into the country and increased the national revenue. I want you to uh, explain a little bit on that. Which goods were being smuggled, and how did he increase the revenue, selling what? So Liberia's egg major exports at the time were palm oil they were mostly agricultural goods a, a little bit and that that's really what Liberia's economy is at the time there's not heavy a lot of industialization I'm not too familiar with it maybe uh, a cow can explain so, a bit more, yeah but... so at that time uh, most of our exports were agricultural mineral um, coffee yeah. uh, palm oil ivory gold, um, calico, which is a, the country cloth that it was very, very highly valued. We were still exporting rice and other agricultural products. Um, there's a whole uh, list of things. In fact, I, I think, Dennis, that would be a good show just to talk about before the economic sabotage, what Liberia was producing. This is sort of at the end. Chiefman's, uh era is really the end of our um, era of production. And, and actual trade. After this, you get into Coleman, you start getting into an era of exploitation. So it is important. Um, so yeah, coffee was a major export at this time and, and, and many other things, agricultural products. Okay, yeah, that's be something to look at Lagros economy mm -hmm. at that time. Okay. So uh, as we stated before, every two years so he's elected in 1893 1895 he was described as very energetic and one with unusual abilities with much devotion to his calling so again this just reaffirms everything that we talked about he's a hard worker he's dedicated he he's been through a lot and he's really showing his commitment cheeseman had to deal with the the third great war some people call it the three-year war 
And that was what required Cindy Chu to the Kabbalah area. Now, it's not the way that that is articulated. It's going to make it seem always between the government and the Grebo people. That's not necessarily what happened. So it was between within the Grebo society, within the Grebo country, there were those who supported the, the government, those who were opposed to it. So it was the government and the Grebo allies that were fighting against these Grebo Op, uh, Grebo uh, opponents, uh, people who were opposed to the Liberian government. And so that's why they, they got this going down. And that's where the gunboats are going to be important as they're going to play a role in, in those wars. Yeah. Jabari, I want to come in for a minute, not to interrupt you, but this is an important point and I want you to overemphasize it. The Grebo wars were predominantly fought between Grebo people. Mm hmm. That's really important. Many of the soldiers and people who lost their lives on behalf of Liberia were part of, were considered to be global. And then the people who fought and lost their lives on behalf of the French and the British. We don't really know this too much. We don't talk about it too much because it's a Francophone border, but the British were also instigating. So many of the people who lost their lives in the global wars lost their lives on both sides of the fight. Also, it's important to emphasize the cultural difference between people in the Southeast and people in the North. When you have don't have that strong centralized uh, authority of, uh, as a kingdom, each clan is almost onto itself to make its own decisions, which is why you didn't have a united position from a united group of Grebo people. Some made one decision and others made another decision. So unfortunately, the casualties on both sides, for the most part, were global people. But I just important. wanted to focus on that because in the context for, for Liberians to really get it, because I think they, they, there's this oversimplification where people think that it was Liberian government versus global people, forgetting to know that Liberians were also global. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. No, and that, that it wasn't that, just. It wasn't just. Um, other yeah, forgetting to know that Liberians were also Grable because yeah, was, that's how was, I was taught that it was Grable people fighting against Liberia. When we go back to the primary sources, you're like, wait a minute, the Grable, the Liberia, the Grable people who consider themselves Liberian were defending Liberia against the Grable people who wanted to be French or British. Right, and, and that oh, that's uh, that is very important because, and let me. Maybe the questions from our viewers will will let you understand where how people have understood this over the years. So River says is, is is shocked. Defense the show against home. The, who wanted to attack us? Then he found the British and the French. <laughs> this right. was right after this was right after the partitioning of Africa. Right. So he said they And if, if we did not have them. if we did not have a military, if we did not have at least try. I mean, those gunboats were nothing, in, you know, compared to the British Navy. And and that's why, and, and, and that's why, even to a certain degree, that's why American gunships had to come for a brief moment and thing, because it wasn't just, like, we can't go up against these major powers. I mean, I, I didn't we bring tried, this up. We tried, though. I didn't bring this up earlier, but this also happened during the Franco-Liberian Treaty in 1892. So during his, around his time, Liberia has to sign a, an agreement with France, with this border, basically saying, we're going to take a piece of the Kabbalah River. We're going to take it here. This is now the official demarcation. So all that land that used to be part of Liberia, it's now no longer part of Liberia. It's now part of what, what today we call the Ivory Coast. So th that's going on. Um, so, so yes, that's why you need these gunboats. And as well as uh, having naval power, having those gunships sends a message of power and projection of power. That also matters is the projection of power. You know what it's like? It's like you 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 you're going to fight. A, a, people are fighting you, and they have all this power. You either go down on your knees and, and beg, or you pick up a rock and you throw it. Those gunboats were Liberian people saying, "We're going to go down, throwing rocks at our at our at our at our invaders." That's what that was. They those gunboats alone could not defend the country, but they were damn well going to die trying. And that was that putting resources to defend yourself against insurmountable forces. 
is courage that we have not seen in the 20th, 20th century or the 21st century Liberia. That's courage we have not seen. And if we and if then if you can go back to the slides, that's not the only conflict that's going on. Remember, that's not we have the French, the British, we have the Grebel War that's going on, and of course the Liberian army defeats those Grebels who oppose and, and they were able to sign a peace treaty. But in the Grand Cape Mount, you got something going on that's going there as well, with with the Gola people and, and uh, previously in the decade before you had the Gola Mendingo, or uh, the Gola, I don't like using the word Mendingo War, I really don't like using that word, but that's happening there as well. And then we got what's going on between France and the Wasala Empire with Savoy Touré that's going on just to the north. Everything is collapsing because the partitioning of Africa occurred at the Berlin Conference and Liberia is an affront to European domination of Africa. Sekou Touré is, I'm sorry, Samori Touré is an affront to European domination of Africa. So they are hitting Liberia from all sides, all at once, trying to squeeze this, this little republic, take its territory, and subjugate its citizens. And, and, and Carl, I want us to uh, talk about this uh, global war a little bit because it's been in our history, and the way we have understood it is like the government... Picture today, the Gribbles are in Maryland, Grand Cru, Sino, and River G, for instance. So picture a scenario where you have the government of Liberia sending troops to the Southeast to fight against the Gribble people. This is how it's been, it's been explained or it's been written and taught to us over the years. You were saying this is not the case. Wait, say, say that last part again. Jabari, did you catch what he said? Right. So so what I'm saying is today, as of today, you have the Gribbles in the southeast, Maryland, Grand Cru, Sino, River G, and maybe Grand Gide, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the government of Liberia, as of today, headed by a president. We are sending troops to the southeast because the Gribbles in that area are fighting the government of Liberia, the central government. And so the government is sending troops there and is being assisted by the United States with gone boats. Did, did they tell did they tell you what the Grable people were fighting for? Right. And let, let me uh yes. So they say the Gribbles wanted to form their own kingdom and, and form the and be an independent country. It, there's an actual source that says that? Well because I've no, never read any source that says that was the objective was to form their own kingdom and become an independent country. I've even, never read that anywhere. Uh, even if you if you do a if you do a, 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 a simple uh, Google search, that's what will come up, or something close. It, when you say a Google search, you mean like just somebody writing like on some website yeah, yeah, or like yeah. is this? Yeah, on, on a on a on a website. Okay, let me give you an example on a globe, so you can make sense of of what I'm saying here. No, I mean, I just wanted to understand. I don't want to prolong the show. We can maybe even do a whole show on the River War. I don't mean to take away from Jabari's presentation, but um, my understanding was, in what I what I know is that they were fighting to put the either the French flag or the British flag over their heads. Right. It's important. Not because... not their own flag. So Maury Toure was fighting to be have a kingdom, but what was happening with these territory wars? was either was was one group you know like like prophet harris before he became a prophet fighting to put the union jack which is the british flag on liberian soil in fact he was arrested for taking down the liberian flag and raising the british flag and while he was in prison while he was in prison is when he decided or not decided but he had the vision to become a prophet and start spreading christianity but before that he was a rebel and he was he was he was basically a British agent, advocating that Liberia be turned over to the British, uh, 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 and, and be colonized by by Britain, and did so violently. Right, Carl. Let me read. A That's piece what's of, documented. Let me read a piece of what is being told to us. And so the and who, who's that, writing this piece? Yeah, just just hold on, because this mm -hmm. is the piece that we have read over the years, and that's what is being taught to us. So let me read it and tell me what's wrong with it. Before you read, can you tell me who wrote it? 
I don't know. Then I don't want, so this is yeah. when I presented misinformation, I presented the author, I presented the publication. Right. And I was able to debunk it. Right. And the reason, the reason is when people write things, you should be able to cite who they are to determine if the person is credible. And then what is their sources that they're citing for the information? Right. So, so the only way to know that is to see what they have written because everybody watching the show tonight, this is what they have read before coming to the show. Okay, gotcha. Go ahead. Right. This is what they read. So it, it reads, it says from globalsecurity.org, Labrin Gravel War of 1876. In 1875, the USS Alaska was dispatched by President Ulysses Grant to Liberia after Liberian troops lost a series of battles to Gravel Warriors. A war broke out among a confederation of Gravel peoples in 1875. The Liberian government asked the United States to serve as mediator. In response, United States emissary visited the Yerebo Kingdom and Liberian Republic and dispatched a naval ship to assist the Liberian government in settling the conflict. In the 1870s, millions of the Gravel kingdoms, encouraged by foreign traders, had united in forming a kingdom in part of Maryland County that declared its independence from Liberia and resumed trading freely with passing foreign ships. War followed, and the Gravel overran several settlements before an American naval ex expeditionary force arrived to quell the uprising and expel the foreign traders. James Milton Turner, the American envoy to Liberia, 1871 to 78, was perceived by both sides of the national political spectrum as intervening in the political battles between the Republican Party and the Whigs Party. Turner assisted the Liberian government in getting U.S. government to intervene militarily in the Gravel War, 1856. In concluding a peace treaty with the Gravel chiefs, the American com commander promised to use his influence to obtain for them a grant of citizenship that will enable them as Liberians to conduct trade on their own behalf without intermediaries. Liberian authorities expressed gratitude for American aid in suppressing the Gravel Rebellion, but ignored the naval officers advised on indigenous African affairs. Okay, so first of all, that ain't uh, uh, a side note. That that whole in information is there. There ain't no sources. Number two, that ain't even the right Gravel War. We're talking about 1892. We're going way back in 1876. So that I don't know what they're talking about. So, <laughs> and so there's different that. Okay, so I don't. That's something completely different. Okay. Yeah. Um than what we're talking about in the context. And that's why it's important for people to write things based on actual records that were kept at the time period, as opposed to just memory, which says what that sounds like, a bunch of things that they kind of remember all put together into a synopsis. That's how it sounds to me. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is why it's important to be meticulous when you're writing something and be able to reference where you, came, where you got mm -hmm. it from, what specifically you're referring to? That was very vague. And and that's what we know. And that's why and that's very, it's yeah. right. That's I mean, people know very various degrees of information. Yeah. I know there's a lot of oral history also. Um, but again, that sounds like it's a, a hodgepodge of a lot of oral information and confusion about dates and times. Mm-hmm. And oral history, and oral history is some truth, but it's not always. Remember, it's oral, so anything can be misinterpreted. It can be changed. So oral history is important, but it's better to have it when it's actually written down. I'm not saying oral history doesn't matter, but oral history can be distorted because, again, that's through word of mouth. And over the generations, what people recall can be different. So. So. We and got also, uh, what what Harris himself wrote. Prophet Harris himself, what he wrote about his own role is the most credible. Mm -hmm. So when you see when you see him saying things like he, you know, he he knew why he went to jail. There's court records. He was tried, he was convicted, and he was imprisoned for treason. He took the Liberian flag down, raised the British flag. That is not someone fighting for a kingdom. And he was the main instigator in this context. And he was literate. He wrote it down. So when people say, oh, history is written by 
the victories. Well, this was a man who became a, a, a one of the most uh, powerful and influential uh, prophets, preachers in West Africa, in history, African preachers in history. And he wrote his own story. He wrote his own biography. He explained why he did what he did. So his version matches what the Liberian government and the court records say match what there are lots of records. And when all of those records tell the same story, including someone who is as prominent as, as Prophet Harris comes out and says, yeah, this is what I did. He didn't deny that he raised the British flag. So how is it now that he was trying to build a Grable kingdom under a British flag? Mm -hmm. And then that, uh, and, and that, mind you, there's another right. sect also trying to fight to raise the French flag. <laughs> so it was yeah. chaos. Yeah. Go ahead, Jabari. Sorry. Not about only that, do you sorry. have the Grebo, not only do you have the Grebo conflict going on, but we have again we have the Gola that are fighting amongst themselves around the Grand Cape Mount area. We have again this place with some more to raid. That that's all going on now. Fortunately, they were able to get a treaty with with the Grebo situation, but that ain't the only thing that that's going on. So next slide. Okay, so in 1892, like I stated earlier, the Franco-Liberian territory, they cede uh, to the Ivory Coast areas beyond Cape Palmas, which Liberia had long control. Uh, what I need people to understand is Liberia is about a third of the size that it once was. Yeah. I need people to understand that the <laughs> map that you see Liberia today is not what Liberia used to look like. Liberia extended from the Galenas territory that was ceded to Sierra Leone into much of what we call Guinea and into much of what we call Ivory Coast. But so just to be specific, it went all the way to what is modern day Zerikori region in mm -hmm. Guinea. All of that Zerikori region that was seized from Samori Ture used to be Liberia. Um, and the only reason uh, Nimba and Lofa stick into Zerikori is because those indigenous people in that area defended themselves against French encroachment. The uh, San uh, uh, Pedro was the, the eastern border of Liberia, and Galinas, which is now in Sierra Leone, was the western border. And Go ahead, that, Yep, and all that got snatched up um, as these Li Liber Liberia had to sign these treaties that they kept encroaching. 1892 was one of them, but it's going to happen in the early 1900s. So President Johnson, the previous president, was responsible for negotiating, but retired before the treaties were signed. So this is a continuation of what Hillary R. W. Johnson had to face. And then the boundaries of Liberia were beginning to officially be established from this year onwards. So now you got it on paper, agreements. So this is what they were beforehand. So that's, the ter that's what's going on territorially. And whenever the whenever the British and French seemed intent on enlarging at Liberia's expense in the neighboring territories they already controlled, periodic appearances by U.S. warships helped discourage encroachment, even though successive administrations rejected appeals from Nairobi for more forceful support. So I always like to tell people, America really never gave really too much about, uh, about Liberia. Yes, they, they had their period of mind of like, yes, we should help them because, you know, we did establish help establish them with the ACS. Grover Cleveland says something similar to that as he was president during that time. But America really could have cared less about what, what happened to Liberia. The only thing, the only reason why they did it was because of interest. They, they There was some interest in Liberia, so obviously you you need them to stay afloat. But the U.S. could have cared, the U.S. could have cared less. They, they, they really could have cared less. Again, you got the crew, Grebo, Gola, all fighting in his regimes. And he, again, Cheeseman has to administer. He has to try to do a, an agreement to try to settle everything down. Because when you have all of this turmoil, that signalizes collapse. That signalizes straight balkanization as they like to call it so you got to try to agree to have some sort of mutual respect and again this goes to the point that i like i keep emphasizing when we talk about liberian history the african americans the repatriates and those who lived who went to liberia lived on the coastline 
they did not have the means and the will to forcefully We have another break there from Jabari. <laughs> through agreement, through negotiations, through Jabari, will. Jabari, we, we love you. We lost you for a second again. So you said the African Americans from America did not have the means and the will, and we lost you. Continue from there, please. They did not have the means and will to just go into the interior and just brutally put people down. That's not what happened. They were relegated to the coastline. Majority of what the the interior of Liberia, Nimba, Lofa, uh, um, Grand Gita, all those territories were governing themselves for the most part. At they this point, in Liberia, but they were they were autonomous. They were governing themselves. So, oftentimes, they this was voluntary. This was willingness. They were willing to work with the Liberian government. That's how Liberia was able to maintain itself. Again, only 16,000 went there. Most of them died. You had recaptured Africans as well with a few people from the Barbados. At this time, there are over 200,000, 300,000 ind indigenous populations. If they really wanted to, they could have wiped Liberia off the face of the map, but they chose not to. Okay, so let's make that, that clear. This is not no brute force. Okay, they're rising up for their independence from this oppression, and they just want to, you know, free themselves. That's not what's going on. So yeah, and Jabari, not to cut you off, and Dennis knows a lot about this conflict. So there was not one united group of Gribbles. These are people that have had ancient conflicts and wars between themselves long before 1822. So they they were not united doing anything. It was there were sets. Also, most of the people who were fighting against Liberia are Ivorians today. The Grebo people, their territory that they wanted to raise the French flag over, they succeeded and they are French today. They're Ivorian today, I should say. That's also important to emphasize. So the, the, for the most part, the, the people at Cape Palmas eastward were not really the people who were fighting against the country. It was really the people who ended up in Ivory Coast. That's the other thing that I didn't understand and so I started digging deeper into it. It was Marias and these others who have these Francophone names that kept coming into Liberia to go to school, to get educated because they were not going to school in, in, under the French, the French uh, regime. So then they started leaking over into Liberian territory to become educated. So when you read a lot of these uh, later 20th century uh, people who rebelled, they had French names because they were coming from Ivory Coast. Their ancestors fought Liberia. Their children entered Liberia to go to school because the French did not want to educate people in that region. They only educated those they needed to use to extract resources. So it's very important to know that the Grebos who are in Ivory Coast today are the very descendants of the people who were fighting against Liberia. I call or uh, River Test Pro asked a question if there was a one group, and that's true, it's not one group, even as of today, there should be over 20 different Gribble subgroups, just like the crew or the, the cloud. Mm -hmm. So it is almost impossible for all, and the language is slightly different from, you know, we have similarities, but it's slightly different. So it's almost, and I can, uh, I agree with you because I'm from that background. People do not really operate under one umbrella. Every group operates on its own. For instance, in Sino, the group are there called Jiripo. In, in River G, you have the Tiempo, the Kilipo, the, uh, the, uh, the Palipo, and so on and so forth, right? So it is more, is it very unlikely for the Palipo and the Tiempo to join to fight one force. It will be the Tiempo fighting on their own, sometimes fighting the Palipo, which are all yeah. the same subgroup of Gribble. So I, I kind of understand that uh, it was not likely that everybody, all Gribbles, joined together to fight against the government of Liberia. Mm -hmm. They were fighting, they were fighting, like it was Liberian Gribbles fighting against those who had been convinced by the French, really. And that's 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 the actual that's the actual um, and, and and unfortunately they won because that territory ended up being ceded to France. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, 
like I said, there were some peaceful negotiations. And then uh, that's the reason why they have the gunboats, because the gunboats were able to uh, defeat some of those who were opposed to um, to the government of Liberia. They were able to squash that down. Yeah. So that's really Cheeseman's presidency. And then we, we got Coleman, which is after after Cheeseman dies and there's a lot of mess with him. And so we're, we're gonna, we'll get into that later. But that's that's the presidency of Cheeseman. Hmm. Yeah. And this also has to do with, uh, because these borders, because right now, if you are in Maryland or River G across, you have the gravel on the other side and they are all related. Same thing in uh, the Grand Jeter area, the crown on one side, the people in Tai and the other areas on the other side. If you go to uh, Yekepa or Ganta, you see the manor across or the mom people across on both sides. So it's always somebody coming from somewhere and drawing these boundaries, not ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is important. I, I, I would disagree with that a little bit. Okay. Because in the case of Liberia, we just said that line was actually drawn by Gribbles. There were Gribbles fighting for the French. And those Gribbles who fought for the French are Ivorians today. So they participated in that demarcation. I wonder what choice they had. So I, I, I still see them as French doing it, and really, and and the and the uh, the gribble hands being used. I I think I think our ancestors were a little bit more sophisticated than we give them credit for. Well, yeah, we really. I I, I I think they made a choice. I think they, they made it's, a wrong choice in my modern mind, looking back. That you know we were not Pan Africanists. We were very tribalistic. We were very clanistic. We were very, you know, onto ourselves and our little clans. Right. And clan so group. if my enemies are over there buddy buddy with the Liberians, I'm gonna buddy buddy with the enemies of the Liberians. That we, we saw that throughout West African so, history. So, it, so it doesn't yeah, it doesn't mean that they were being they were willing participants in this division. Um, um, what, what what occurred in Nimba and Lofa is different. There you have Wosulu Empire, Samori Ture's empire, the last great Malinka empire was Samori Ture's empire. What you have there now is you have these Poro nations, these Poro ethnic groups uniting to fight against the French and try to defend their territory. Because once Samori Ture fell, they wanted to take the entire area he controlled, which was that's part of Liberia that sticks up into Zarakuri, northern Lofa, northern Nimba. Right. And what did they do? They were successful. At the St. John River, they were able to hold them off. And they did not cross. So that becomes the boundary now of Liberia. Nobody drew a line with, with a pen. That line was drawn with blood. With the blood of Nimbians, the blood of Lofians, the ancestors of modern Nimbians, the ancestors mm -hmm. of modern Lofians. That's important to emphasize. That's a different story from what occurred at the Kavala. <laughs> River, says, <laughs> River says that's not true. <laughs> we have to we have to understand history as it is. He said what? No, uh, River said, I'm, I'm fighting hard to defend the dignity of his people. He said, he's fighting hard to defend the dignity of his people. He doesn't want them to be portrayed as traitors to their country. Well, what I understand is these were all clan-based society. So the concept of Africans fighting against Liberia did not exist. Is is in their minds. Is uh, well, I'm here has this little set of gribble. And on the other side, these are my, my enemies. So I'm going to fight them. Because these people were fighting each other long Dennis, this time. these people, these people, I'm going to go back to, to Prophet Harris's own document. He mm -hmm. said he raised, in fact, the court records in his own writing, he raised the British flag. He removed the Liberian flag and yeah. hoisted the British flag, instigated the uprising. This is not somebody saying, I'm just fighting this little clan over here. This is someone who is saying, 
I want to be under this other. And in fact, when he left prison, what did he do? He went, first place he went was Ivory Coast. So you have both the French and the British doing the same thing at the same time on all boundaries of Liberia. And let me show So the British are over trying to also take Liberia as, as well as the French on both sides. So it was a proxy war between the British and the French to take over Liberia. And if it had not been for the Grables who defended Liberia and the United States sending support and the 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 the, the other, you know, the Liberians themselves, Chiefsmen, if it had not been a collaborative effort of indigenous people and the, the people who established the republic, there would be no Liberia today. Let me read a comment from an elder who is probably in your 60s or early 70s, and uh, Joseph Kokori said, wow. After more than 50 years of thinking, what Dennis read earlier about the Gribble War with Liberia was the true story. I'm astonished today to learn otherwise. So just like most Liberians, Mr. Edo Kokro is in his uh, late 60s or early 70s, the wow. same. After 50 years of believing that what Dennis read, now I'm finding the story to be otherwise. Carl, what do you make of that? It's it's um it's humbling. It's humbling. And I understand um how that can be, you know, disturbing and unsettling if you believe something a one way for a very long time. And I appreciate him having an open mind because what usually happens is people reject new information if they've known something even for five minutes, let alone for 50 plus years. So um, what we're hoping to do, and I know Jabari is on board with this, is just really encourage people to take a step back and reassess what you think you know and learn for yourself. There's more information available today, especially to people in Liberia, than there was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Information is more accessible today. And so as we learn more, we learn better, we have to replace the, the false narrative with the factual information, the documented information. And if you think about it, it, it makes more sense. Just it, when you hear the truth, it makes more sense. It's getting late. I'm sorry. We're going sideline here, Jabari. You might need to do a part two. Mm -hmm. Let's go. <laughs> right. and, and so, and so you 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 know, being familiar with uh, Labyrinth history, uh, the way we understood it, that's why I insisted in reading that, and you see the results. The Kavala war is over. President Cheeseman came down with a military force and settled the difficulty so that peace prevails. The Kavala River is now open to uninterrupted navigation and merchants, white and black, can carry on their trade. This is uh, M.J. Osmond Wilson, Secretary ACS. December 3, is that 1896? Yes. It is a matter of regret that while recognizing American philanthropy has the promoter and founder of our national existence, yet we cannot account for the apparent retirement of the interest heretofore advanced by the United States government. The United States government cannot but recognize the relationship that naturally exists between them and ourselves, a relationship they cannot ignore and that demands of them greater consideration and sympathy for our efforts to establish a home for the oppressed Negro within our borders. What does that mean? You're asking what, so basically um, he, he was pleading for assistance, for intervention. Um, That's basically all that was, almost, um, in a sense, uh, a cry for help. Who was crying for help? Didn't you just read Cheeseman's quote? Right. Okay. I'm so sorry, we, I didn't I didn't put that, his name. I apologize, Dennis. This, yes, this is President Cheeseman. This was quote from President Cheeseman during the, the at this, this period of turmoil. I apologize. I thought I had his name there. No. Oh, President First Lady Cheeseman. Yes. 
Did you see the the um, letter from Mr. J um, from 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 Jay Wilson? This one. Yes. Actually, no. This is um, okay. Go ahead. So this basically, I'm sorry, Jabari. Let me let Jabari conclude, and then we'll talk about his death and what happened afterwards. Jabari, you're con Where are we, Jabari? Oh no, that's it. I have my my, my slides are done. The presidency, yeah, that so, that's it for the presidency. So one thing I want to say before we, we close this out with his death is Jabari, you did an excellent job of providing the context in the greater, and this is why I, I appreciate him every time he comes on here, is this need for us to look at Liberian history in the context of regional history and world history. Liberia doesn't exist in a vacuum or in isolation. It is a part of a process that was happening globally. And I think Jabari masterfully presented this multiple conflict situation, how now they've partitioned Africa, Liberia standing up as a as an affront, as a you know affront to uh, uh, European domination of Africa. It's it, Liberia standing up as um, basically a a a, a uh, condemnation of every ideological reason they have used to to partition Africa. This lie that African people are not able to govern themselves. This lie that African people need to be controlled by other people that we're not as human, you know, as other humans. You know, this global concept of white supremacy, which is really new in relatively new in history. We don't realize that. But I really appreciate you for that, Jabari, that context was important. And Dennis, I also think it's good that you were able to bring in, hey, this is what we've been taught. And this is what we've been, you know, uh, what we've been told our whole lives because it, it, it puts things into perspective. Now we can see what the records state, the actual primary source records versus the narrative that was created fairly recently. And I wanna so say, mm -hmm. and I wanna say whenever we're looking at these primary sources, context is, is, is important, ideology is important and language is important. Yeah. So when you read a primary source, whenever I read a primary source, and I see words that I don't know. I look up those words and understand what was the context in which these words were used. Because oftentimes you'll read primary sources, and the the wording is very is very flower, flowery, is very bombastic. Some of the words they may use, you're like, why do they use those words? But if you understand the context and you understand the way that in which people wrote back then, it's going to start to make sense. So whenever yeah. you read the primary source, understand who's writing it. What's their ideological framework and the words that they use and understand why? Because that's going to make everything make sense. If you read a primary source and just read it and take it at face value, it's, you're gonna you're gonna find those, those problematic the, the, the problematic statements or the problematic situation. But if you understand the context, the ideology, what they were trying to accomplish, then it's going to make more sense, and you, and you can enjoy actually reading those primary sources. Yes. And, and yeah, I mean, this is, that's that's the gist of it. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, want to, I want to I want to pick on a few more comments here and uh, give okay. my response. And uh, one of the comments. Oh, oh. yeah, we gotta address that question. We yeah. gotta address that question because I, 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 um, it seems about? like it seems like that question doesn't wrap wrap people's brains. Which, which question, Jabari? It says in the first sentence, "How is America the founder of our national existence? Are they God?" We'll, so, we'll, come, we'll come to that, Jabari. Let me okay. let me answer uh, Elvis because he said, "What we've presented means native bad America, America Labrin, good and hero." He continues uh, because I, he, he continued another southeastern. Another show of Southeastern Slender uh, is Slender on this show tonight, and uh, something else he said. So let's let's agree that the Gribbles in Africa chose to be with the French. What's bad about that, right? So if I have to make a choice, if I have to choose between being Liberian or being Ivorian, and I choose to be an Ivorian, I mean that's my choice, right? So 
so to call that a slender or to do a so the, 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 the first problem with Elvis, the first problem with Elvis is many of us were raised, unfortunately, with very hateful tribalistic mindsets that you can't even comprehend. It is. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Hmm. When you try, when I was growing up, one of my, my mentors always said, racism makes you stupid. And what he meant by that was it makes you irrational. You're not able to reason. You're not able to comprehend things correctly. Same thing with tribalism. Tribalism makes people in incapable of comprehending things. Because when you're tribalistic, you see things in terms of tribe and not in terms of what actually happened and, and not looking at human beings as human beings. Here we're saying that Grables are the reason Liberia is still Liberia today. Tribal mindset won't let you hear that. What you're hearing now, you focus on Ivorian Grable people. You're not focused on the majority of Grable from Cape Palmas coming all the, the Liberian Grables, their ancestors fought for Liberia. So he's not even hearing that because again, the mindset, it's the same way racism skews your ability to understand things. That's what tribalism does. You can't even hear all of what we presented, that it was indigenous people that are responsible for Liberia existing. But what you hear, native bad American Liberian hero, because you want to hear us bash a specific group that you've been raised to hate. Right. So and even when we are humanizing our ancestors, when we're humanizing our indigenous ancestors, you can't hear it. Because there's no way in your mindset that you can humanize an indigenous person and humanize what you think is an American Liberian. I see human beings, I see Africans. And when I speak of African history, I speak of African history in the context of African people. I don't care if you speak Grable or if you speak English or if you speak Madlinka or whatever it is. You are an African and your story will be told and the human beingness of your story will be told as it was. So if you unfortunately aren't able to comprehend that, that's too bad. Rewatch right. the episode with a clear and open mind. But clearly, we have stated repeatedly on this show that this is this Liberia is only possible because of the collaboration. There were lives right. lost on both sides. Right. And thank you, Cohen. This is how I understood him because I come from the same background. Is mm -hmm. this, uh, it, it is not tribalism. Is uh, maybe ethnic loyalty and ethnic pride. So how is it pride? How is that pride I, 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 to say Southeastern is bad? I, I'm and, 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 and I, and I want to. What I, I, I have is pride. What I have and is I pride. And I may not be from. And I may not be from Liberia. <laughs> yeah, so, and and so, I understand people say ethnic loyalty and all that. Yeah. But to yeah, me, let, let me explain it. Maybe you, okay. maybe maybe I'm not using the right word. So when I'm growing up, and I'm and they set me down and tell me how, for instance, the Grable people are warriors and they are congruous and they are this and they are that and all the good things. So most of the oral history when you are taught is uh, you are always victorious, right? So all these good things. So if there is a narrative that say, hey. Some of your people also die in the war. You you may find it hard to accept, and it takes, especially something that you've been taught over the years. It takes time for you to finally accept it. All right. Then so that's a little disingenuous, with me, though, because one of the things I've made an emph I emphasized was that yeah. the Ivorians, the Gribble people, Ivory Coast won. They literally yeah. won that war, and I said that multiple times. I, I, I know. They won the yeah, war, I'm and sorry. that's why that's why Liberia ends at the Kavala River. That's where they drew the line. Right, and I want to say so. This. They could not have won that war if they were not warriors. The right. line is drawn at the Kavala River. That territory belongs to Ivory Coast because those Grable people won, and I said that earlier. Right. We'll just be patient to explain it. That's all. We'll yeah, but it. I mean, the thing is, it is patience, but at the same time, you can't skew people's presentation and and be dishonest just because your 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 perception is based on your disdain for a certain group of African people. You cannot be African, hate African people, and love yourself at the same time. I just want you to cannot be you African, cannot be hate close, African so... people, and love yourself at the same time. You can't sit here and try to pretend to be pro-black and be pro-African. They sit there and act like they're so pro and then dehumanize your ancestors and simplify them and, 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 and make them look like they were some kind of 
you know, dumb primitives that didn't make decisions based on things that human beings make decisions based on. They had enemies across the Kavala River and they fought those enemies. This was made clear. There is no one homogenous group of Grebo people before you say exactly. there's a homogenous group of natives. Exactly. That, that's the point. I, I, but that's I what thinking. tribalism does to people. It makes them skew the understanding of reality. He, he just sees things differently. He's Go a tribalist. He needs to graduate from that. He's no, a tribalist. He, he, I've he, had interactions he, with him enough to know how he was brought up because I know many people that were brought up like that. And until he opens his mind to reality, that's how he's going to think. You know, you can't understand yeah. history through the lens of hatred and tribalism. It won't make sense. Mm -hmm. Again, and I wanted to address, and I wanted to address that 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 next question when he was talking about America. He was like, "Are, are they God? And and why do we give uh, credit?" He's like, "How was America the founder of our national existence?" And, and it's oh my gosh, when America we, didn't found Liberia. We know America didn't found Liberia. They're like, <laughs> "Oh well, Liberia was here." No, it wasn't. If it was, they would have already named it here. Okay. I, I, what 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 we have right here is what I call classic projection. Let me project my feelings onto Liberian history in Liberian history earlier that area of the world instead of actually taking that face value. How many times do we have to explain it to people? The place that we call today Liberia did not exist. Okay, that don't mean they weren't there or they didn't contribute, but. Liberia as a country did not exist. Okay, that that there were many yeah for people to understand. They were their own kingdoms, their own clan. They had their own alliances. If Liberia existed before African Americans got there, they would have called it that. They so did. the best way, yeah, the best way to explain it is this: um, Liberia was established in an area that had many nations, many ethnicities, many different cultures, it was a diverse place. Um, there was no united group of native people living in a country. You had many in the Southeast in clan-based societies, you had kingdoms in the North. Like what is now modern Liberia is a modern state, a different concept than what existed before. The nations and the people who existed in, in the territory, in the region before, the descendants of those people, my people, your people, Dennis, we are still here. But when these people came and this concept of a modern state was created, it was created is a Western concept and it was created with the, um, you know, by people who came. That's just a fact of history. The second thing I want to emphasize is the entire world was changing. When Samori Ture, and we have a whole episode about Samori Ture, everyone should watch. He was the last Malinka empire. Samori Ture was the last attempt in our region for self-governance. Everything else, everything else was about <clears throat> who is going to be, under what modern state are we going to exist? Samori so Ture was the only one who raised his own flag. Samori so Ture was the first indigenous organic African flag raised on the continent, older than the Ethiopian flag, second to the Liberian flag, but Samori so Ture's Muslim empire was not a Western empire. It was the last Malinka empire and he raised a flag. There was no flag for a Grebo nation, a Vi nation, a Mono nation. Only the Malinka people did this through Samori so Ture's Muslim empire. That's very important, but that's a different episode. So when we talk about these things, we need to understand the context. There was no group of Basa people or Pella people who were raising a flag saying we want our own country. In the modern sense of a state. After the partitioning of Africa, the only options were European domination or to remain Liberian. Many, many indigenous people chose Liberia. That's the reason Liberia exists. If they had not, there would be no Liberia. The descendants of repatriated Africans and liberated Africans, I mean, repatriated African Americans, liberated Africans, and Caribbean people could not have done it alone. There were not enough of them. Okay. 
so let's uh this one and called. no river says pro it's nothing like christopher columbus nothing at all we, there was no genocide we still live nobody went there and said they discovered liberia they interacted i mean you got to go back and watch and this right. this kind of narrative and this kind of talking is really it's, it's sad really it's sad yeah. you know to compare liberia to what the genocide that took place in north america is just it's, it's, it's absurd but people don't, because when you don't know your history, you take other people's history and put it on your head. Most Liberians think that their history is American history, and it's not. There was no massive land grab, no genocide. You know, it's just, it, it, it's crazy. And our, yeah. our societies, you know, were actually much more complicated than, than, than the indigenous people of North America. Because we were not isolated populations. We had been interacting with the world for many centuries. Many, many centuries. And you can't compare. Thank, even thank you. Thank you, Pat. Let, you let's, let's go back because we don't have okay. much time now. So let's go to uh, the letters call you talk about. Because we have 10 minutes to close. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, this is just, uh, you know, closing. Um, uh, Mr. Wilson in 1896 uh, writes to inform everyone of, of, of President Cheeseman's death. Hmm. You can start with dear sir. It Dennis? is our duty to inform you of the death of Joseph James Cheeseman, President of the Republic of Liberia, which sorrowful event occurred on the night of November 12, 1896. He had suffered a week or so previous to his death from two attacks of epilepsy. And though death was then feared, he seemed to rally and the country had hopes of his recovery. The president was 53 years of age. His loss is much regretted. He was eminently practical and very successful. During his administration, he had succeeded in bringing about a state of peace with our coast natives such as had not existed before. There is now no native trouble throughout the Republic. The great question here is, where shall we find another Joseph James Tisman? Add his name. Yeah. And this one, Department of State Monrovia, the next day, uh, in consequence of the demise of the late Honorable Joseph James Tisman, late president of this Republic, which sad event took place at the executive mansion last within the 12th uh, at 10.30, the Honorable William David Coleman, Vice President, will take the oath of office today and enter upon the duties of the Chief Executive immediately according to law. God save the Republic. G.W. Gibson, the Secretary of State. So G.W. Gibson says God save the Republic, save the state. Look, Liberia was under siege from all sides all sides and Africa was under siege and Liberia rep represented everything that they did not want to see in Africa, which was self-governance. And so Cheeseman uh, dies, uh, they say of, of, of asthma, respiratory issues, but his health failed mostly because of this tremendous stress he was under trying to hold the country together. Their greatest fear, their greatest fear was to see all of their territory and all of the people within the territory subjugated by Europeans and the kind of, 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 of horror um, that was occurring in Ivory Coast and, and under British rule, especially uh, under French rule. Um, so here he was, President Cheeseman demise, Coleman takes over, um, steps up as the vice president under tremendous um, pressure and, uh, and, and conflict and in two weeks, we're going to tell Coleman's story, um, you know, and, and Jabari is going to join me. <laughs> we're going to follow a similar a similar um, plat uh, format. We're going to do the genealogy, and then we're going to talk about in, the presidency. So, I, you know, that that's that's basically it. And uh, Cheeseman the Great, the first lady. son of, of of Grand Bassa. We want to talk about the first lady too. Yes. She's beautiful. Yes, she was. And they adopted a daughter during the war. So Victoria Cheeseman, she comes because she uh, the war happens, her village is destroyed, 
And so uh, she gets adopted by the Cheeseman family. So that's another thing. Yes. And that happened a lot. The, the adoptions of, of, of abandoned children and, you know, children who lost the war. But um, a lot of adoptions, a lot of people's children um, didn't survive. But this is, this is uh, I think, was a, was a great episode. And I hope you all join us for President Coleman. There's more conflict, uh, more drama. Um, more to unfold, but now we're getting into the era where um, you start to see the shift in the paradigm. Liberia, the, the, this is what I call the buck breaking of Liberia, the breaking of the spirit of Liberia begins under, slowly under Coleman. Th thank, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> in, when I first read uh, about the, the, the waves of migration and why people were coming to Liberia. Sometimes well, things, things get lost and, and we kind of tend to forget, you know, why we are here. And so most of these things go on. So in uh, 2019, when I went through some of the history lessons here, this is what I wrote. And I want people to pay keen attention. And I call this poem, Liberia Means Freedom, because I found out that uh, we came from somewhere. We had the... Uh, the Vi, the Gola, the Kisi, the Grebo, Mandingo, everybody coming, everybody was coming for freedom. I don't know, within that, there is a mix. So I want to also end with this poem that I wrote. Labra means freedom. They came from the north, east, and west. Many of them came on foot through the jungles. Others came in boats, canoes, and ships through the waters, all seeking refuge from war, dominance, bondage, and threats. They wanted to be free, left alone to enjoy life and thrive. The Gola, the Vi, and the Kiti were the early birds. The Grebo, the Klao, and the Kua with their, all their cousins. The Mandingo, the Man, Dan, Bandi, and more. The former slaves and those rescued from slave ships all converged on a land that would symbolize freedom. For this purpose, a Pan-Africanist nation was built, a country born out of the need for deliverance from all evil. No matter how and when they came, freedom was the goal. And that is how Liberia came to be, and so must it be. The glorious land of liberty by God's command. This is what I think Liberia is, and this is what we should all strive for. You know, forget the global war, the cruel war, or the bandy war, and we are here now. Let's forge ahead and make Liberia that grow. That's I don't think we should forget. I think we should never forget. <laughs> well, I forget in a sense of uh, not being uh, angry about stuff that happened in the past. But how do we use those occurrences to forge ahead and build a united Liberia, which is, uh, which we, it goes back to the goal, you know, Liberia was set up as a, an, an oasis of all free black people. To what extent each and every one of us contributing to that very objective. Yeah. That to me is my new year message to the Liberian people. Happy New Year, folks. Happy New Year. Happy we'll see you next year with a, with Coleman. And now I'm gonna go and celebrate <laughs> the last yeah. the last few hours of the yeah, year. We have a few Damn. Hours to cross. And uh thank you all for being here and even our viewers and those who will watch later. The Labra History Channel is growing, continuing to support us. Uh, right now we are even running a fundraiser to raise funds to extend our operations in Labra. We want to get on the radio. We want to have more correspondents across the country so that this thing that we are doing here will go further than what it is now. Until then, we want to close with our song that says, we are all Liberians. Have a good night, happy new year, and God bless you. You too. We are Liberians.